Coach PJ here. Let's learn how this young man created a $7 billion shoe business. And he started from pretty much nothing. And in 11 years, he's built this business. Let's take a look. The idea, I liked the feel, but I didn't like the look. So it's like uh, with uh, pieces of garden hoses are included in a shoe, you're not going to make the business. If anyone could see the potential in a running shoe with garden hose attached to the soles, it's Olivier Bernhardt. The six-time Ironman and two-time world champion triathlete spent decades training at the highest levels of competition. But after leaving the sport, a friend of a friend reached out with a bizarre contraption. When it comes to running shoes, the usual suspects like Nike, Brooks, and Asics are tried and true. But when Roger Federer decided to invest in On, the running world took notice. Sales were up 77% over 2020, and On is expecting to generate over $763 million in sales by the end of this year. The three numbers to look out for in this story are 1,000, the amount Olivier took home after winning his first professional race. 150,000, his annual salary at the height of his earnings, and 746 million, the amount on raised and its IP. In just 11 years, the upstart shoe company went from zero dollars to a valuation over seven billion. Here's how a world champion triathlete landed Roger Federer on their way to creating one of the fastest growing shoe companies in the world. For CNBC Make It, I'm Nate Skid. This is Founder Effect. Olivier grew up this close to the poverty line on his family farm on the Swiss countryside, far from the urban city center and the cool shoe stores found inside of him. So you call, could call them in some ways entrepreneurs, but not so much in, in that kind of business driven. Uh, so not so much. No, I think I just got the athlete's spirit or athlete's gene in my blood running. And I think that got me really started. In the early 80s, he became enthralled with endurance athletes, competing in a new sport called triathlon that combined three of his favorite activities. But he wasn't the fastest sprinter, the most adept biker, or the strongest swimmer. He was, on the other hand, exceptional at enduring the physical toll. But turning his passion for triathlons into a living was a long, hard road. Olivier was stuck in a cycle. I still remember that I had to collect some prize money every race I did in Europe in all the to pay the next flight, right? So if I didn't make any prize money, I had to skip a race. His first real payout came at the age of 21, finishing first place in a marathon in Tucson, Arizona. And I won 1,500 US dollars and a box of power bars. And it was like Christmas and Easter and everything in one day. I couldn't believe it. But after paying his brother back for the entrance fee, Olivier took home $1,000. And so began a two-decade career, culminating in two world championships and six Ironman titles. So how do you go from, you know, like an aspiring athlete to a three-time world champion? You know, often in, I see the same thing pretty similar in business. Uh, don't think too much about, you know, what's on top. I mean, just take step by step and, uh, you know, enjoy the levels you reach. At the height of his earnings as a professional triathlete, Olivier was bringing in about $150,000 a year. By the time he turned 30... Let's stop there for a minute. There's a couple of things to notice. One is he talked about the long road. He's an entrepreneur. We're going to talk about the business he built, the $7 billion business. However, he's got a lot of life, a lot of experiences behind him where he wasn't earning that kind of money. He was pushing forward. Also talked about the fact that this was his passion. He loved running and he wasn't trying to get into something he wasn't familiar with, wasn't good at, wasn't passionate about. He was looking for a solution because it was something that he needed. And when you find a solution, when you find a product or a service or something that you need, that you understand what the customer's looking for, you really, really connect with the consumer. And therefore, sales comes differently because you're not guessing what they need. You know what they need and you've been a consumer. I find that very interesting. Uh, it's uh, a lot of work, a lot of work that he get, goes goes into this. Um, on most Like most entrepreneurs, it's not an overnight success. It might look like it from the outside, but it's not an overnight success. Let's watch his journey. 35, he knew his career was entering its final stage. 
In 2006, at the age of 37 and after having three kids, he entered his last professional race. So when you're kind of wrapping up your career, you know, it sounds like some people have a hard time kind of letting go of that competition um, and the training. How did you make that transition? How did you make that move? I mean, it wasn't a clear cut. I mean, yes, ending the career was a clear cut, but, you know, training so many hours and as a long distance athlete, you spend a long time on a bike and also running, you know, out in over, right? And sometimes in the desert too, so on a long a dry creek. And, and I always was thinking, you know, about not only another running shoe, but another running feel. How could I place another running sensation in, in a running shoe? After retiring, Olivier founded a coaching company and even had 100 athletes in his camp. But he just couldn't shake the idea of coming up with a better running shoe. Oh, I don't believe so much in luck in life. I think it was just, uh, you know, it was something that needed to happen that a friend of mine, you know, then now a friend of mine, but an engineer, Siri called me and said, look, I have an idea. Uh, I uh, want to put it on your shoe, on your existing shoe, and that's pretty much that ugly looking, you know, old Nike shoe, uh, Pegasus, and he put on something that looked like over actually pieces of a rubber hose. You know, and I said, I'm not going to run in these, right? But then finally, I, I ran in, in that sample and, and it struck me. It was something I never felt before. And there was so much of that sensation. I felt like, whoa, this is really helping the runners to to show what, what, what running is all about. Olivier says the difference was the way the rubber hose not only padded vertical movement, but assisted horizontally as well. Now, Olivier might know a good running shoe when he sees one, but he isn't a numbers guy. So he brought in two partners who knew each other from their time at McKinsey. If anyone could help Olivier turn his crazy shoe idea into a profitable business, it was Casper Capetti and David Alleman. In 2010, Trio launched On out of an office in Zurich. So how did you bring the team together? What was that like? I realized soon I'm not going to, you know, be the businessman in a one-man show that can actually pull this off. And I realized that I'm probably not the numbers guy. I love numbers, but there, that's the guys out there. I love design, but I've not studied design. I love marketing, but I'm not the market here. So I reached out to Casper, who used to be uh, my agent uh, at a certain point of my professional career as a triathlete. And he then brought David on board, who was his best friend in his career. A couple things that he said that were very key. One is he said that he dismissed the product out of hand. His friend came to him with the idea that he was going to put this rubber hose on the bottom of shoes, and he dismissed it. That's not uncommon for entrepreneurs, that people dismiss your ideas. They think they're silly. They think they're they're kind of outlandish. Uh, the fact that he actually tried it was and he took him seriously to try it and then he found that it wasn't a different experience is huge because sometimes we dismiss ideas and we don't pursue them and we could be passing on something that's actually quite interesting second is he knew himself he knew he wasn't the numbers guy he doesn't mind numbers but he knew he wasn't the numbers guy the marketing guy he wasn't the engineer that he needed to bring in people who were smarter than him. That's huge, is he understood that he knew the sport and he knew the athlete, and that was the lane he was in, but that he needed to engage with people who had depth in their areas of marketing, engineering, and the financial elements to make this a success. Let's keep watching. Maybe I wouldn't say how much, but each person invested the same amount in the startup. And I think that was really the fair point to start, right? In 2010, just three years after hanging up his cleats, on was born. But now they had real skin in the game, and it was time to act fast. They flew straight to China to begin working on a manufacturing process. We had to be super quick. I mean, we knew, you know, we, we can't lose much time, and we won't lose. I mean, every uh half year you know we lose or every two months we lose it's, it's costing us only money so we had to be very quick in six months they took on from an idea to a prototype its first production order was for ten thousand sneakers the company generated about a hundred thousand dollars in revenue that first year but those early shoes were squeaky and not exactly aesthetically pleasing so they came up with another prototype this one called the cloud racer in 2013, the on-team headed to Munich for ISPO, the 
largest sports gear exhibition in Europe. Expectations were low. But on a whim, they entered the Cloud Racer into a competition for the Gold Award. They beat out over 300 competitors at the exhibition. This was a big deal for such a small company. But that was a neat push, a needed push at the very start, because I remember Casper and I driving to, to Munich from Zurich. It's a three hour drive with the car. We said, let's make a promise. You know, we only going to sign three countries. It's Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. No others, because we, you know, we need to focus our energy. And uh, we sat in the car three days later, and of course it was 19 countries. That same day, Kong received an order for 2,000 pairs of Cloud Racer sneakers. The only problem? The shoes didn't exist. Do you know how you guys employed your cash? At the beginning, uh, I think in shoe business, or in many cyclical, cyclical uh, uh, companies, right, our business, it's, it's, it's the risk that you actually have to pay the product before it's even produced, right? Even us being a startup, they wanted to see the money before they even would start sewing, you know, or producing outsoles. And then, you know, you pay maybe half of it and then the other half as soon as it's on the boat, and you only get the money once, not only once the, the product is actually sold to the end consumer, then you maybe have, have another like 60, 90 days till you have any money on the bank account. The team was kept. So before we get into all the cash flow elements, there's a couple things that he talks about. One is that um, they entered the competition and that was key because they got on the scene. They got in the, um, the mix. They were on the radar. So entering the competition really put them on the map. That was huge. Also talked about being quick and the fact that they need to be quick to market. They weren't worried about exactness. They were worried about quick to market. You said that the shoes squeaked, that there were some issues. If you're a perfectionist, they would never have launched. They would have tried to fix all the issues before they went live. Instead, they went live with a suboptimal product that got the job done, but may not have looked as great, not have been a great design, but was able to impress the marketplace to kind of reinvest back into it. But being a perfectionist definitely holds you back. And then they talk about the numbers and the fact that this is a cash flow. The cash flow is an interesting element to this because they're not getting their money until long after the product has been made, the product has been shipped, the product has been received, the product has been sold. So there's a long cash flow element to this business that you have to be able to fund. And if you're working in three countries, it's different than if you're working in 19 countries, the cash flow elements get larger and larger. Let's keep watching. Cash poor, but received an infusion from four angel investors. Olivier did not disclose that amount. So what did your expansion look like? Was there, you know, like you land these 19 countries, which is fine, but like you still have to sell shoes. You know, you not only have to convince the end consumer, but even more the retailer. And the retailer, you know, he has a reputation or she has a reputation on the line. Not only at the beginning, we would go to retailers and make a presentation like all other brands would do, right? And then we were just unhappy and uh, uh, with the results, you know, they didn't buy in and they, not at the end, they would not say, uh, you know, give me the order form and I order 50 or 100 shoes. They often said, oh, I think about it. And we all know what that means, right? <laughs> Probably not or not now or not yet, right? And we said, why don't we go run with them? And then what happened, and realized that really after one or two times we did it, they started asking questions. They said, oh, I actually like the landing. Why is that landing so soft? And why is actually then, but why is it so rigid in the forefoot? And how come so propulsive at the very end when you push off? So it was much easier to answer the questions they had about our technology instead of trying to sell them our technology. And that really made them the turnaround. So I really love the idea of like, let's stop talking about what this thing can do. And let me just like show you. It sounds so, so much better. It's honest, right? It's the honest way of saying it. It's not me trying to sell thing, right? Something it's, it's really you tell me if you like it or you don't. And then if you like it, you probably want to know more, right? Ong's brand of experiential marketing was effective. In 2013, the team was only 10 members strong. Then in 2014, Ong's running shoes were worn by Nicholas Spearing, 
who took home the silver medal in the triathlon during the Rio Olympics. I mean, it's mind blowing. It's not only that you see, uh, even though we see people competing in these shoes is something else, right? But then you to see that athletes go for medals at the Olympics is, is something else, truly. That was truly super emotional. Then they noticed an Instagram post by Roger Federer, who was wearing a pair of on sneakers. So, like any good marketer, they sent him a gift package. It didn't take long before they were having dinner together and talking too. So, like, how did Roger come into your life? Like, how does that even happen? You know, the funny thing, and, and I know still talking about it, it might sound a bit arrogant, but it wasn't us finding Roger. He found us. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, we'll be there as a young Swiss running shoe company to sponsor Roger. So that's not going to happen. We wouldn't have the funds. So we wouldn't even think about that, right? So it was him reaching out to us and saying, uh, maybe there's a way we can pop him up. And he was never, you know, actually, you know, he was never in the room saying, could it be a sponsorship? He knew that we were too small and it's not our fault, but he wanted to become a partner. And what was your reaction? To be very honest, we were a little afraid at the beginning, you know, is this even too big for our brand? You know, is he, his name is like, you know, uh, I mean, everyone knows Roger, does he now become, you know, Roger owns on a side of, you know, uh, everything else he's doing. And Roger was always aware and he always wanted to be very careful that this is not the case. In 2019, Federer invested an undisclosed sum in On and is currently designing a customized shoe for grass, clay, and hardcore. He came in the office maybe the second time he visited or came to the lab and he said, my aim is to build the best tennis shoe ever. The pandemic has been good for the shoe company. A few things to notice. One is the kind the concept that you try it, you like it. They didn't try to convince them with logic. They actually used the shoe and used the experience to convince folks. Let them have the experience, and if they then are interested, um, I have clients that are that sell um, food products. Let them experience it, let them taste it, and then you'll get them hooked. So if you have a, have something that you can sample, something that you can get people engaged in, then they actually might like it. They might turn them into something else. They also, as I said, they didn't pursue Roger Federer. They, he found them, but then they were open to the possibilities of what he wanted to, how he wanted to participate. They just worked with him to have the conversation. He did say they were a little fearful, you know, afraid that maybe this would, you know, make change the business in a way that wasn't where they wanted it. They were a little, you know, fearful, but they didn't let the fear hold them back. And in many businesses, we can feel fearful, but to overcome that fear and use it as excitement versus anxiety or to hold you back uh, is really important. Is it not to let your fear hold you back? Let's see what they do. In March of 2020, sales stopped in their tracks, but by the end of the year, they were tripled the sales volume from 2019, and the world took notice. On went public on September 15, 2021, and raised $746 million, with a valuation of $7.3 billion. So, you know, why make the decision to go public? Like, how did that come about? If you want to play in the big league, you know, and with us in Europe, you would call it the Champions League, like in soccer, right? And you want to compare, you know, and fairly compare to Adidas, Nike, Brooks, and, you know, all these big guys when it comes in terms of financials, you, 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 you know, you have to play the same rules. And I think that's one of the reasons we, we've grown up and we think that we want to be comparable to these companies because we want to keep growing. Uh, another important thing is, is governance. You know, we have a dual share construction that we actually can secure our uh, a majority and so we can steer the company the, the five of us and that's super important you know as you grow and have your financial rounds you, you might lose a majority and we gained that back through that dual uh, share class and that's an important thing and then uh, last and maybe that's even the most important thing is we have huge dreams we have dreams how to make more olympians on track on the road and to make these dreams come through we need resources, right? We need financials, we need funds. And uh, yeah, the IPO is like a big ATM machine, right? So you can then go and get this money. 
So you know, it's maybe a couple, you know, most important reasons why I feel. And now the company has over a thousand employees and sells shoes in more than 60 countries with North America making up its biggest market with about 40% of its business. You know, I've only written down one note this entire interview. And I want to bring it back to like the very beginning of this interview. You said, don't look at the top. Look at what's right in front of you. Like, can you walk through that philosophy for me? I remember one of the first talks when I got to know David. You know, Casper, I knew from uh, being my agent for a long time. But David that mentioned, okay, let's do it. You know, uh, let's think about the business plan and who we're going to attack. I said, no, we're not going to attack. We are competing, but we're not going to attack. It's not, you know, a confronting sport. We are at the same starting line. And we are small, we are slow, you know, and we don't need any numbers for the big guys right now. We should just try to make the best product on the planet. I like his philosophy. We are just going to be the best product on the planet. We're not going to look behind us at our competitors. We're not going to focus on that. We are going to focus on ourselves and focus on building ourselves. So a couple of things he talked about overcoming fear. He talked about following your passion as entrepreneurs. That's what you need to do is, you know, don't let fear stop you. Don't let perfectionism stop you and follow your passion. Do something you're really, really passionate about. If you like this video and you'd like to see more, put uh, some suggestions in the comments below. If you would like to get together for a cup of coffee, if you'd like to learn more about what I do, uh, we can do that. Just uh, put a comment in the uh, lots below and we'll find some time to get together. Helping you get the business you deserve, your business profit. Until next time.